everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is our 220th episode being recorded on September 26th, 2012, I think. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malventano. Uh, if Alan sounds hungover, he's not drunk, he's just tired from travel. Alan, how long has it been since you left Korea and arrived at home? Less than 18 hours ago. That's faster travel time than I usually get coming back from Taiwan. Did you, where did you go? Did you come in through L.A.? Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. How long was your layover there? Hour and a half. Okay, see, my layovers usually in LAX going from Taiwan and home are usually like five to six hours. So it makes things much more awful, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the podcast. If uh, you haven't been paying attention recently, don't forget, uh, we are now recording this live at pcper.com slash live every Wednesday at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, 7 o'clock Pacific Time. So uh, if you are awake and around and capable of having an internet connection at that point, uh, head on over to pcpro.com slash live and hang out with us. If you want to share the podcast with people, give them this URL, pcpro.com slash podcast. You'll get this amazing website right here. Here's, uh, here's last week's episode uh, where we all talked about stuff. And uh, this week before, and we talked about other things. So if you missed out on all the hardware news, Man, you can just go back and, and listen to hours and hours and hours of Josh and me and Jeremy and Alan talk. Don't do that. And sometimes Scott. And sometimes Scott. Sometimes Scott. Yeah, we, every once in a while. Uh, so, yeah, we don't have a, a huge amount of things to talk about this week. It's been a little bit on the slow side. However, if you want to play uh, Battlefield 3 with us after the podcast, it's another benefit of being here live is we just sometimes we'll just pick a game. Most of the time, we'll just pick a game and play for an hour or two after the show. Uh, we're going to play Battlefield 3 tonight at the request of many people. If you want to, yeah, Ken being one of them, if you want to play, you need to join our PCPer.com platoon. It has, uh, you'll recognize it immediately because it has an icon of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It seemed the most appropriate at the time. I don't I don't really see the connection anymore. But at the time, the Transverse Rex was the, was the most badass of all the icons available. So sign up for that if you haven't already, and then we'll, we'll jump on and we'll stream some of that as well. Uh, but let's jump in and talk about a couple of reviews. The first one, we're actually going to speak with the man who just recently returned from Korea. In Korea, partially because of this specific product, a brand new Samsung series of SSD. The follow-up to the 830 is the 840. Yeah, see what they did there? Uh, 830 was, correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, probably our favorite SSD up until this release, right? Correct. So does this take over as the new favorite, or is it just a little bit different? Well, performance-wise, yeah, I would just sort of call it the, the successor, right? Okay. But realize that it was, I mean, it was something that was already the best one out, in my opinion. So, um, you know, even though there's, there's only some areas where it really did excel a whole bunch, um, for example, anything that's just a, if you're only doing reads or you're only doing writes, mm -hmm. the drive is much, much faster. Um, and the reason is the CPU in the drive is like 20% faster. Um, it's a slightly different architecture they changed. I think it's a smaller process node, actually. They, I think they dropped it down. Um, the power consumption is really, really good. So if you have a choice between an 830 and an 840 and you're using it in an Ultrabook, uh, if yeah. you have one that you could fit that in, for example, or any kind of laptop, um, that's... Like we're we're talking, I think it's around a quarter of the power consumption. Okay. Like an actual typical use. Um, I'm looking at the PCB just uh, <laughs> here on our on our screen. Yeah. There seem to be for this is a 512 gigabyte SSD, but I only see eight flash chips. Is that right? Correct. That's because Samsung is really good at stacking those uh, those dies inside those packages. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Because yeah, um, the back of the PCB can... is completely empty. Yeah, I think Samsung's able to go 16 high if they really wanted to hmm. uh, inside one of those. So, um, Wow, 16 chips are in that little package. Well, they could be. They, they're not in this drive, but they could be. Um, okay. So the other thing that uh, causes the big speed jump and actually the big latency reduction is the fact that the communication channels, the actual channels from the controller... Hey, did my video cut out? Nope. Well, no. I don't know if yours did. Your audio is still here. Okay. Um, yeah, the communication between the controller and each flash memory chip used to be 133 megahertz 
uh, DDR, and now it's DDR. I think it's like DD, the equivalent of DDR two four hundred or something like that. Yeah. So we're talking now. How long ago was it? We had DDR two four hundred like RAM, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and this is uh, now. Granted, it's more of a serial kind of channel. You don't have like a sixty four bit bandwidth coming out of the coming out of this uh, this flash chip or anything. Um, but still, very very fast, right? The faster you can go, uh, the faster. Um, some aspect of the latency is right because okay. uh, because a portion of the latency for turnaround time you're waiting on, on a request from a given flash chip. Some of it is just the bandwidth of that bus, right? Um, so that between that and the controller, uh, if we did just pure random reads at 4K, which we don't do as a specific benchmark because we do more of the IO meter, the combined testing that sort of gives you a bigger picture. Right. But if you were to just do 4K random reads. This drive hits at 100,000 IOs per second, like right at 100K. So, what is where um, is that? Give give me some idea of what what is that in relation to, like the okay, so 4 the, 830, the 830. The 830 did around 80K. Okay. Um, so it's you know another 20% jump, um, but still, it, it's actually hitting that. It's it's hitting, it's really hitting the 100K because it's hitting the bandwidth limit of serial ATA 6 gigabit as well. Um, it's basically as fast as the bits can get pushed across there. Usually a drive has to be larger block sizes to hit that bandwidth limit. Okay. But this drive is so fast it's able to hit that. What more. test on our in our suite should we look at to, to maybe see that? I can show one of the one of the pages here. That difference, the web server on the IO meter. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, that's one that's a pure random read type test. There we go. All right. And it's able to show where the drive really stretches its legs because it's not a mixed test. So that's wow, the other okay. thing. That so I it's was, all the way at the top. Yeah, it's it's the best one by far on that. Right, and and that's the other thing that I wanted to stress was that the, the when you do mixed I/O with this drive, it's the flash memory itself is about the same speed. It's just talking faster, right? So if you're doing mixed, um, you know, really heavy power user kind of, you know, you have a bunch of writes going on in in tandem with a bunch of reads. Yeah, it's going to be around the same speed as an 830. Um, it's just the way it is, but. Um, but it does really, you know, speed up when you do if you're doing pure writes or pure reads, and the sequential writes are faster on this one. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's good all around. Uh, the more interesting tidbit that I'd like to talk about briefly, which mm-hmm. we can only touch on in the review of the 840 Pro, because we didn't have much information on the other drive. There's an 840 that's a non-Pro version, and that's going to use triple level cell flash in it. This is the first drive um, we've seen using TLC, right? And I don't mean tender first, loving uh, care. Say again? Nothing. Go ahead. Yeah, oh, well, you know, Alan is taking that one into a sleeping bag, too, so TLC <laughs> does make sense. Yes, yes. Um, so, I mean, we've seen TLC drives just like at CES, in a booth, right. on a table, that kind of thing, not, not actually, uh, you know, supposedly shipping. Uh, and the 840 is supposed to be shipping now, from what I understand. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like in the stores for you to buy it for another couple of weeks, but it's supposedly like going out to them. Um, and it uses triple level cell flash. There's more over provisioning involved to try to get the endurance a little higher because triple level cell flash is just not rated for the same endurance as MLC. So is this cell. where we're going to see 500 gig SSDs instead of 512 gig SSDs? Uh, yes, actually, you can go sort of by the judge it by this. It's uh, that's the 200 and 256 gig model. It's only 250. Okay. Right? Um, so there's uh, some more over provisioning to it. Uh, that helps get the endurance a little higher. And Samsung also dropped the warranty on those drives down to three years from five. Right. So they're not meant to, you know, you can't beat them up as, as badly, but you have to keep in mind that these things are rated for so overkill compared to what a typical person is going to do to them, even in a desktop machine. Um, you know, the, the, the wearing them out is based on writes, not reads. So even this triple level cell 840 uh, non-pro version is supposed to be rated for 98,000 IOPS. So right up almost the same speed do we, as the uh, 840 Pro. What do you know about the pricing of the non-pro versus the pro? Do we know anything on this? Because I know if we go to the last page of the article, we see, you know, the 840... We see it's MSRPs, but because it's not shipping, we don't see any of the kind of like sales and deals that we we tend to get with uh, uh, with SSDs in general. So you right. know, the 840 Pro looks kind of quite a bit higher than it should be 
uh, in relation to everything else in the market. Do we know anything about at least relative how, how much less expensive the TLC-based drive will be? If from what I saw that from the MSRPs, realize mm -hmm. that's all we had sure. to go off of, right, their initial MSRPs, it looked like between 10 and 20% cheaper per gig. Okay. Um, and hopefully between that reduction and combined with just the reduction you end up seeing between MSRPs and, and actual retail, I'm hoping that, you know, this translates into, into something real good. I will say that the, the 840, the non-pro, it's going to have a lower iOS per second write rating. That's just because it's triple level self flash. It takes longer okay. to erase blocks on that. Um, it's just going to be a little bit slower to drive and writes. But from what I've seen of this controller, I realize it's the same controller in both drives. It handles, uh, when it does any kind of caching on small random writes, because it does cache just a little bit of that. Yep. Um, most drives don't, but the Samsung ones do. Uh, I think that's going to be enough to overcome any kind of uh, hiccups you might have seen trying to use the drive in, in normal day to day use. So. I think it's going to be pretty transparent to the end user. Um, again, they're not going to be, there just won't be as endurance based as the MLC flash models. That's just the way this cookie has to crumble for that. Um, and they're going to write a little bit slower, but I think on balance, it's going to be between the controller speed ups and the flash memory throughput speed ups and everything else, I think it's just going to overcome it to the point where the the non-pro version of the 840 is still going to be pretty good even compared to everybody else's MLC drives. The, the, one of the interesting parts of this discussion is, uh, or like we were talking about, I don't, think, I don't think we had started recording yet, but uh, the 830, the Samsung 830 actually went on sale for a little bit this morning for $169 for the 256 gig version. Is that right? So that yep. puts it at what, 60 cents per gig? It was gig? 66 cents a gig. Right. Today. So now all of a sudden you look at where that is and, and that's... You know, if you were looking for an SSD, that's the SSD you want to buy uh, when it was on sale for that. I don't think it is on sale for that anymore. I, I think only they, three hours long. It was only probably three, because they three probably three. just sold out of them. Well, no, they they said right at the beginning this is only good for three hours hmm. until okay. quantities last. Yeah, or one or the other, whichever happens first. So, uh, you know, it, in in my if for for my money, it's almost like. Basically, if you're looking to buy an SSD, just kind of hang around and watch. You know, I tend to post uh, links to good deals on SSDs in my Twitter feed. Um, this one I didn't get until too late, so I didn't actually bother to, to tweet it out. But, um, you know, the 840, if it actually comes out at these prices, it's going to be a hard sell, I think, for the consumer that's just looking for a really fast SSD. I think the average consumer doesn't care about the move from 80 to 100 IOPS. You mean, you mean the 840 uh, Pro, Pro or non-Pro? Pro. Pro. Yeah, yeah, because I see I see the I see the non pro model sort of just replacing the eight thirty, probably even at the same price point. Yeah. Which um, that that's all great and everything. So that what that means if for people like me or Josh or Ken or anybody listening that, that's just looking for an SSD, keep an eye out for more of those eight thirty sales if you can get them for the sixty cents sure. know, per gigabyte range while they still last. Yeah, I wouldn't say yeah, if you were on the fence between an eight thirty and eight forty right now and like an eight, even an 840 Pro, I mean, unless they're around the same, you know, yeah. same cost, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, the 840 Pro is a better drive, but it's when it comes down to, I mean, 830 is already such a fast drive. Right. So for most people, it's, it's sort of a wash there. Right. So why, why did Anand's results show a greater delta, greater delta performance over the 830 than, than really yours did? Can you kind of compare, contrast... Sure, he does uh, some, uh, some of his tests. Some of his tests focus on like pure 4K random read, for example. That would show you a different thing. But when you're my, my take on it on, on benchmarks for just showing benchmarks for drives. Sure, that's a good test to say. Okay, if the manufacturer says this thing does 100K, does it do 100K? But that's not a test that you don't, you don't sit at your computer and do 4K random reads with nothing else going on. It's just not a. It's not representative of any kind of actual use. Right, it's a pure synthetic thing. Um, so we cover the synthetic things more along the lines of the the PC mark, you know, some of the other benchmarks that we do. We do have, you know, the file copy test. You have things that are doing; those are also synthetic, but they're again, they're more realistic. They're attempting right? they're to just, model real world usage uh, usage scenarios, I guess. Yeah, it's actual things that you're doing on your drive. You might conceivably be copying a batch of files around on your drive for some reason. That's a good thing to time and see how fast it actually happens. I right? might do that. Yeah, I might. Might. Yeah. Did you ever get that uh, that trace 
program from Intel? The um, yeah, we dabbled around with it. It doesn't. It doesn't quite work as expected. It's a uh, no. And they uh, actually never kind of came back with a with a real simple use case uh, or you know like uh, usage information. I guess I'll from, say from from what I was able to tell. And here's the specific problem with it. It sits. It sits in the middle of the whole the whole communication stack. Basically, you have the kernel, and then it goes through several layers of. APIs and drivers and different layers, and it finally gets down to the hardware layer, the, the, dri the actual driver for the serial ATA controller. Right. Then it communicates with the drive. There's things that happen, um, for example, native command queuing. Right, That's the thing that really ramps up SSD performance because it sort of cheats and can see what commands are coming ahead of time, and it can issue you know, more commands at the same time. Right? So that, that lets the drives accelerate on speed. That's what gives us our, the, those ramp ups, those slope up ramps on the, on the IO meter test. Because right, we're hitting it with more IOs at the same time, um, that kind of a measurement, the Intel tool will only see the sequence that came out of whatever was asking. It won't see how it got reorganized before it was before it got to the drive for command queuing and whatnot. So it's not there's there's still variables basically. It's not like you can. Uh, the idea behind that tool was that you can take a trace of a certain kind of IO, like you can install Office or something to the drive and capture it. Um, and with, if you were to take that and record it with the Intel tool and then play it back on several different drives, it might act completely different with those different drives, just based on command queuing. And if you're hitting the drives with a whole bunch of IOs at the same time, uh, you're not doing the same thing to every single drive. It's close, don't get me wrong, but you can get like 95% of the way there with, uh, with any kind of a synthetic like PC Mark style benchmark in the end. Because that's also doing the same thing. That's just a replay. Gotcha. Oh. And uh, Nuberific did find a Tiger Direct uh, link yep. uh, for the 830 for 179. Ooh. So only 10 bucks more than the New Egg deal. And it's still going on right now, huh? Ends 9-26-2012, which is today. So hurry up if you want to do it. I guess if you're listening to this and recording podcasts, sorry about your luck. You should go to pcpar.com/live. Wednesdays at ten o'clock, we give the, the, the we give the good stuff, the hot news scoops, hot and stuff. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, you know what else was was probably running hot? Actually, I don't. I don't. Actually, I don't think that's <laughs> the case. Uh, Lee posted a review of like the power supply to end all power supplies. EVGA. We saw their power supplies in C at CES. You know, kind of like they're like, yeah, we're gonna see these. They'll be out sometime this year. It's taken a little bit longer, I think, than they had hoped to get these out and release. But Lee did a review of the EVGA Supernova NEX 1500 watt power supply. And it is... Uh, is it a champagne supernova? I hope so. No, it's an Ardbeg supernova. I mean, look at that. Look at that. It's, got a, it's got a great... Uh, what, you, what do you call that finish? Like a... Uh, it's got huge tracks of land. Huge tracks of land. It's got a, it's got a giant handle <laughs> sticking out the front. Uh, and you can tell like the power connector is is different than your standard power it's right as well. in the middle if you know what I mean so look, look at some of these specs so uh, it comes with supernova power supply control and monitoring software kind of similar to a couple of weeks ago we talked about what Corsair was doing I imagine both these guys are using the same kind of monitoring controller I don't know if that's the case uh, it has an adjustable 12 volt uh, rail you can actually overclock it to 1650 watts uh, if you have a 230 VAC input, you can switch between single and multi-rail 12-volt connections. It has a 10-year warranty, 80-plus gold certified, 90% efficiency under typical loads. Um, it's, it's expensive, uh, but it has, like, everything. Where's, the, where's one of the pictures that shows the connections? Um, I don't want to go to the specs. The it's pictures, got everything? The, the, Oh, everything. for you, Josh, it's got everything. Yeah. Where's the, where's the picture? Okay, here we go. No, no, no. There's one. There's one picture in here where you see all the Check connectors. The that is really, really impressive. What'd you say, Jeremy? Oh, no, no. Check the stream there. The, the chat. Oh, okay. I think that's the one the, you mean. Does it have the oh, uh, oh. the the product that the uh, new guy linked in in Yammer today from Japan? I, I think it could the, power that. The yeah. Android. Uh, I'm gonna go with no. <laughs> no. I'm go with no. So here you go. See these red cables right here? 
There are 16 PCI Express connectors. Why? I don't really because know. Because they can. Uh, 16. Uh, that's, wow. Eight, four or, or six or eight pin. All right, here we go. 16, six plus two pin PCIe. Three, six pin PCIe. 12 SATA, eight Molex. Two floppy. One yeah. USB connector. Don't forget the floppy connector. Don't forget the floppy connector, just in case. You poor, poor sap. Uh, and then, what was the other picture? Hey, it'll power a USB 3 uh, add-in card. Yeah. Look, it's got dip switches. <laughs> look, look, it's got dip Ooh, switches. dip switches. And one of the dip switches disables all the other dip switches, which I think is kind of hilarious, too. It's the one dip switch to rule them all. Exactly. Yes. One of them allows you to turn the uh, power supply on without a motherboard, which I think is cool. One is to enable the overclocked mode. One is to switch between single and multi-rail 12 volt. And one of them forces the fan to 100%. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, but I mean, look That's at all the, the bring the noise all switch. The connections. Yeah. That's some major trollage there that you could do to somebody. Why is my power supply so loud? <laughs> or why doesn't the damn thing work? Usually, hopefully if you buy a 1500 watt power supply, you're smart enough to know what you're buying, I guess. But um, <laughs> you can see here, like all the cables plus the, the USB header coming out uh, connects to your operating system and you get this kind of software. You can manage the, you can monitor 12 volt outputs, 5 volt, 3, 3.3s, input currents, output currents per rail, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty interesting software uh, to see, right? And we, and we saw, again, both Corsair and EVGA now have this. But EVGA, you know, they weren't going to release a power supply until they had something cool like this to, to really kind of show fan speeds, all that kind of stuff can be controlled. So I, I'm not going to go through the whole review. But if, if you're interested in all the metrics that Lee usually goes over with for this, for this unit, uh, check it out. It, it can do 1,500 watts continuous power, 124 amps on the 12-volt rail. So, so if Alan connects those to his nipples, what would happen? <laughs> He'd end up in North Korea again. <laughs> nice. Uh, it did get a gold award. So Lee obviously liked it. The only weakness is a little more AC ripple output than, he, than uh, he would like to see within spec, but a little bit more. Obviously, it's NVIDIA SLI certified. Go figure. It has 16 PCI Express power connectors, guys. 16. It's gold. 16. Gold. Uh, so... Check out that review if you are in the mood for a lot of high-end power supply goodness. Uh, we This is the part of the show where we take a quick break to thank our podcast sponsor. I'm looking over to Ken for some kind of notification on yes. Okay, we're, we're prepared. Uh, so we're going to thank Alex is going to join us again with a message for MSI. Hi, Alex. The all-new Z77 M-Power mainboard from MSI is poised to change the overclocking game. Every Z77 M-Power board will have a factory 24-hour military class burn-in test completed before shipping. Additionally, performance-optimized features such as GoToBIOS, MultiBIOS 2, VCheckpoints, Bluetooth 3.0, and onboard Wi-Fi allow users convenience and total system control over their overclocking and gaming experience. This is the new endurance champion, Z77 M-Power from MSI. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, let's see, we're going to get into some news items. We don't have a huge amount of them today, but I want to start with this one. I think Jeremy will be excited about it. How about the ability to overclock a Raspberry Pi with a turbo mode to one gigahertz? Hey, why not? I mean, the Raspberry Pi is really taken off. A lot of people like this poor little arm-powered CPU with a little video core stuck on the side with just about every single plug that you'd want for a very basic system. People are having a lot of fun programming them for them, and now they're putting a turbo mode on it. So all of a sudden, you know, the USB driver uh, reduces its interrupt rate, and you see about a 10% jump and increase across the rest of it. So if you've got Wi-Fi, uh, it's going to perform better. In fact, part of this uh, is an update to the Wi-Fi. So if you're running Wi-Fi on Linux, it will actually work out of the box pretty much, which is a nice jump. Uh, on the other hand, it if you hold down a, a shift key, assuming your USB is working at the time, you can immediately revert back to the base speed. So, you know, it's it's pretty much a safe way of just trying to get an extra 10% out. So, 
you know, hey, it, it's going to make a little bit more power to this little tiny device that uh, a lot of uh, kit builders and people that just like experimenting are going to have a lot of fun with. And it's nice to see a little bit more juice out of it because, I mean, with the 10% overclock, it hits a gigahertz. So, you know, <laughs> it's not blazing speeds, right. but hey, at that speed, you know, a 10%, you're going to notice. It, it technically will be noticeable. On the other hand, it's going to suck down a little bit more voltage, of course. So if you're not running off of mains, it may draw your battery life down a little bit. So, you know, as always, there's a little bit of something to be paid for with the extra power. I like that uh, all you have to do to do the upgrade is run a pseudo line. Yep. For AppKit update. Pseudo more power. Pseudo make me a sandwich. Pseudo overclock to one gigahertz. They should make that a, they should make that a thing. It's a Cortex-A8 uh, processor, isn't it? Uh, based, yeah, modified. Yeah, it's it's too bad they you know didn't use some a little bit more modern, but I guess they wouldn't have gotten to the uh, what twenty five dollars twenty five dollars they yeah. had. Is the is the deciding point there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, at this point, they're avoiding any licensing costs whatsoever. You know, this is pretty much just the cost of what it takes to put this board together and ship it to you. Yeah, enclosure extra. Uh, now, I don't know, I don't think anybody on this podcast would consider anybody else in this podcast prudish when it comes to sex or violence, right? Especially Josh. Oh, I'd hope oh. you wouldn't think that of us. <laughs> so, I was, I don't know about you guys, but I was a little bit put off by the murder box as a name for a case, right? It's just like the murder box modding limited run. I'm MK2. gonna put my wife in that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's a limited run. It's a twelve hundred dollar murder box. I think you can. Well, get I mean, all those knives less cost money. That. Yeah, uh, it's this is enormous. And keep in mind, this is just a case. It's not a system. It's not some custom. So it is large, and I can put my wife in there. You you could. You'd okay. have to do the murdering first, yeah. I think. Well, no, yes. force her through to the get everything to fit, but. I don't, I don't, I don't think this is going to work out. I don't even know if we uh, would want to recommend this for our Jeremy. Wouldn't we? We wouldn't even put this on our dream system, would we? Would we add a twelve hundred dollar case to a dream system? If if you really desperately wanted it to spend that much money on a case, go for the original level ten. I was just saying, how much was that? At least it's nice. That was the original one was about a grand. I think okay. it was just a hair under a grand. The one yeah, that like was with uh, the BMW. Bucks. But this is a limited edition of 499 units. Limited edition. Oh, so it'll go with your Skull Trail system. Well, if you still run that, I guess, yeah. Well, I it's mean, a limited edition. Come on. What's, yeah. what's Tim say here? Uh, the back uh, of the case is removable. Uh, it has a removable motherboard tray. It's been a long time since we've seen one of those. I, I kind of miss that, to be honest. And it has a integrated card swipe feature, which will charge you more money. <laughs> you just swipe it every day, and it's ten bucks just to keep using your twelve hundred dollar case. Actually, yeah. you have to swipe for it not to charge you. The Murder Box MK2 features a spot to hold a water cooling reservoir on the motherboard tray that slides into the case. Uh, it's space for a four hundred and eighty millimeter water cooling radiator in the bottom, and drive bays that are pre-wired. You put the storage drives into sleds, slot them bays, and are connected and ready to go. Uh, it can hold three three and a half inch hard drives, three two and a half inch SSDs, and a single optical drive. And on the top of the case is a slot loading DVD drive. So there is a little bit of extra hardware you get there with it. So there you go, everybody. Your twelve hundred dollar murder box. Murder. Murder box. Murder. Murder box. Josh, let's talk about global foundries, three uh, D transistors, FinFET, which. I don't know what that means or stands for, anything like that. Is this kind of uh, what we saw Intel announce with their 22 nanometer 3D transistor stuff? Yeah, well, pretty much. Uh, but, you know, we're still kind of talking apples and oranges here because uh, Intel still uses bulk silicon for this. Now, Global Foundries, they're wanting to go to this uh, FinFET technology at 14 nanometers which uh, is going to be most likely based on fully depleted SOI. Now, we can go into this for hours because this is one of the things that I'm, I'm researching for an upcoming article. Um, and I really don't even know where to start, I guess, with Global Foundries and 14 nanometer, right? Yeah. That's probably a good idea. Uh, no, they announced that uh, 
at the 14 nanometer node and below, they're going to go with these 3D tan transistors. Now, other than Intel, nobody else uses them. And at 22 nanometers with the bulk silicon, Intel was essentially forced to use it and develop this because you needed to have a lot more interesting and exotic materials to get 22 nanometer to work in planar structures. Now, this exotic material that we're talking about is uh, the upcoming fully depleted SOI wafers, and they still can utilize uh, planar structures on the silicon wafers and still have performance that uh, is comparable, if not a little bit better to what Intel has right now. Uh, but yeah, they're, after you get below 20 nanometer, you're going to have to go with these, these 3D structures, these you know, 3D FinFET uh, transistors that Intel has so famously made and uh, is using in their current Ivy Bridge processors. Um, apparently, I've seen some of the, the first uh, negative comments about Intel's process technology in that their current 3D FinFETs and the wafer technology that they're using, just the, the bulk silicon, it's not it's not the panacea that, that they were hoping for. Um, if you look at clock speeds and TDPs of products based on the 32 nanometer process from Mattel and those of the 22 nanometer, namely Sandy Bridge and Ivory Bridge, very, very close, or at least, you know, similar uh, in in architecture, you know, have we seen a big jump in uh, clock speed? I think what the twenty five hundred was a three point four gigahertz product. The right. thirty seven seventy was is, is a three point five gigahertz. And even though yeah. they they knock down TDPs a lot, you know, knowing what you know, how do these parts overclock as compared to each other? And you know, what kind of power consumption do they have? Uh, you know, Ivy, the Ivy Bridge parts get hotter. They run at lower, I would say they run at lower uh, default voltages, but when you start to add a little bit more voltage to them to overclock, they accelerate, they get, they get hotter a lot quicker. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a trade-off, right? I don't know if part of it maybe is also the fact that they're, they made the process, you know, they're trying to tune their process for these super low voltage parts in the future anyway, right? So maybe this is just the first step. And they realize, look, we're not going to have to make super high clock speed CPUs to stay ahead of any competition we have. So why bother, you know, stretching it out for the overclockers? It's not really, you know, our bulk markets for, for income. Yeah, that's true. But I guess just, just looking at, at a technology perspective, mm -hmm. which we should do, hence the name. Yes, yes. Yeah, anyway... Do you see any overclocking performance difference in between Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge? I would say Sandy Bridge overclocks a little bit higher, easier. Yeah, and this is part of the reason why the 3D FinFETs for Intel, they do very, very well for low voltage, low power. But once you start ramping up the clocks, putting in more power, they start to have more negative effects than even the previous 32 nanometer generation of the products. And so this was, you know, the, we saw hints of this at the Ivy, Ivy Bridge uh, release. And now that we're uh, starting to figure out a little bit more about the technology, we're seeing how it reacts, that it's just, it's, it's, it's a very good process. They're doing very well. But it just is not hitting the, the thermal and performance and, and voltage um, specifications that they were hoping for. Now, at this point in time, materials is still king. I mean, we've seen the jumps in, you know, uh, uh, low-K dielectrics. Uh, we've got high-K metal. We've got all kinds of, you know, the partially depleted SOI from AMD, IBM, uh, a couple other uh, guys out there. And now we're going into this new fully depleted SOI. And we're starting to see some real interesting performance factors with fully depleted SOI. And I think that, in fact, Intel, when they go to 14 nanometer, are going to be using a much more exotic mix of materials for their wafers. It may not be fully depleted SOI, but it's going to be kind of like it. And uh, this is a company that just spends billions and billions of dollars a year on their process. And uh, this is something that they have a huge advantage over from everybody 
And because they're not just hitting hurt. the market with it, they've had it on market already. Yeah, and, and it doesn't hurt that their designs are superior to everybody yeah. else's as, as well with the, uh, the Ivy Bridge. <laughs> um, so with that one-two punch, I mean, it's no wonder that they are 80-plus percent of the processor market. Um, and we're going to see them utilizing these lower power with Haswell, uh, what, Cedar, Cedar Trail? It's going to be the, the Atom the replacement. Clover Trail. Clover Trail. That's right. Yeah, Cedar Trail. It's, it's going to find its way into tablets there. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Exactly. And as long as they don't have any competition in, in the IPC, they, they still can clock their things, you know, their parts lower and take advantage of, of the, the low voltage, uh, you know, positive uh, characteristics of the mm-hmm. process and put out good parts. But, you know, they're, they're still a year away from Clover Trail at least. Uh, we've seen what Medfield does on phones. Uh, somebody had uh, some benchmarks of a, of a 2 gigahertz um, Medfield against some of the other current well, uh, I, I, cell phones. I, 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 what, we're closer to Clover Trail than that. Clover Trail will be in some of the Windows 8 tablets uh, this year. This year, really? Yeah, yeah. Clover, Clover Trail, which is essentially the same architecture as Medfield, just a little bit faster. Uh, we'll, okay. Will be will be in in tablets this year. Well, it's it's needed because uh, yeah. performance and, and power consumption of Medfield is is it's not very good as compared to like the Crace. And they just recently released iPhone five uh, A six processor. So. You know, we could go on with this for hours yeah. because it's you know it, it's fascinating to me. I think uh, I think we'll have more to talk about next week on it as well. I think I think there will be a couple of announcements, wink, about that kind of stuff and those products that may make it um, more relevant and easier to discuss next week as well. Yeah, but uh, the uh, the owner of Global Foundries, you know, what M- Mubdala? That- sure, I don't remember anymore. Yeah, uh, they're they're pouring billions into global foundries, and uh, they want them to compete more ably with Intel. And uh, they're hoping to have 14 and 10 nanometer products by 2014, so they can actually match what Intel has. And uh, if if they're able to do that and be able to bring these products out uh, at a decent price, then We'll automatically see, you know, companies like AMD be on an even level with Intel when it comes to process technology. Right. While AMD may not have the designs that uh, match up well with Intel, I mean, that's that's another topic altogether. But you know, Boomdala is 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 they're very serious about making money with global foundries, and to do that, they have to compete just toe to toe with Intel. Mm-hmm. And they got to get there first, so it's, it's going to be tough. very interesting to see where the company goes. And and I know that you had more contact with them in the past years than than I have. So I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about it. Well, I've had more contact, but I have way less background on on the transistor technology than you do. So I, I think if anybody's going to be able to talk about that stuff, it is going to be you. Um, I think I think maybe we're coming up on uh, a transitional period where we need to sit down with them and have more interviews and talk about their technology and where it stands in relation to their primary competitor. You know, they won't come out and say Intel is their primary competitor because they don't want to look at AMD as being their only customer, right? They want to go up against Samsung and TSMC and those guys. That's that's what they'll tell you their their primary business is going to be is taking their customers. They're not trying to build a product that competes with Intel because, again, even as much money as as uh, you know he they, that group can come up with. Do you want to go up against Intel and a product that, you know, they kind of own the whole market for? I don't. I don't really know. So. I I think so because if you look at all the, the fabulous semiconductor guys out there, their entire market share of all their products outweighs that of Intel. I mean, if you look at ARM, all the people they license to, how many processors out there? I mean, it, it's far more ARM processors are out in the world right now than any Intel x86 CPU. Would you agree or partner with Global Foundries? Yeah, I mean, Global Foundries has a product that can match Intel's process technology, but be able to utilize, you know, an ARM A15 or whatever else mm-hmm. they have in the future uh, with their 
their 64-bit uh, products, people are going to want to go to them. I mean, TSMC cannot compete with the billions. UMC, they can't compete. Uh, you know, Siemens, Samsung, Infineon, all these other guys who still own fabs, I mean, they, they just don't have the R&D budget to pour money into process technology, not like the oil money from the Middle East. And this is, you know, this is a Middle East group that has all this oil money, but they look at their oil reserves and think, wow, those are shrinking fast, and we better have something to base our economy on other than the natural sand. resource. Sand. <laughs> base it on <laughs> sand. Exactly. And so they bought Global Foundries. <laughs> yeah. Genius, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, so let's move on past that. We'll talk more about it as some other product announcements are made. Let's talk about other future products. Maybe like uh, the, I think, last, was it last week we talked about the Sea Islands, like the 8,800 parts? Correct. Uh, how about we talk about the 8,900 parts this week? I'm sure AMD is ecstatic about it. So apparently... Uh, we talked about the mid-range 8800 series last week. Well, now we're hearing about the seven. Or I'm sorry, the 8900 series, based on TSMC's uh, 20 nanometer process. Still, this Tenerife is the code name. For, no, it's Tenerife. I've been there. It's Tenerife. It's Tenerific. Uh, so, world's fastest GPU. They say based on an enhanced GCN architecture, more than 1.2x the compute power of AMD Radeon 7970. Now. That doesn't sound that impressive to me, though. 1.2x the compute power? Like, that's only 20% more. Am I, am I missing my math somewhere? No. Okay. But they're going to call it the Venus XTX. So, I mean, how could you not want it? Come on, 20% improvement from a half generation. It's not horrific. I guess. It's not great. They're not, you know, I just figured it'd be more than that. They would figure out how to do clock speeds more or something. Maybe, I guess. I don't know. But they don't mention anything else that impresses me, uh, like like lower power consumption. That would be the primary goal here, right? Can we get 20% more power at 25% less power? That's, that's probably the goal there. So they're saying 2,560 shaders, 160 texture units, 48 ROPs, 384-bit memory bus, and an alleged transistor account of 5.1 billion which puts Billion. it uh, a decent amount above the 4.3 of the Radeon HD 7970. Uh, the Venus XTX. Yeah, um, Yeah, we're not entirely sure if this actually exists or if this is a true thing. It, it most likely correct. is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a year going on, the release of the first 28 nanometer parts, it's not beyond the imagination to see something like this coming around because they do need a refresh... I mean, it, it, NVIDIA is not standing still. Right. And uh, with something like this, it's not... I mean, you, you know more about the uh, the process. The process itself is better than what it was a year ago. Yep. And so you can get away with a lot of these things like, you know, higher clock speed, same power envelope, and uh, better overall performance. Do you worry... And it's going to be a while till we see 20 nanometer parts hit the market. But do you, but do you worry about the uh, supposed 400 square millimeter die? I mean, as compared to, say, like a GTX 580 that had something closer to a 530 millimeter square die? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is interesting territory because AMD and NVIDIA are switching sides again, right? We looked at NVIDIA's with the, with the GK104, no, yeah, 104 being smaller, more power efficient, yet still able to keep up with the 7970. And here they're going from 365 millimeters to four, around 400 millimeters and 4.3 to 5 billion transistors um, for an increase of 20% performance. No real indication on what performance or what like power benefits they get out of uh, this, this kind of refresh. Well, something to also consider is this is a part that would compete with the GK110 from NVIDIA. Mm-hmm. And is actually smaller than the GK110. And yes. in overall terms of performance, it is in the same area, if not outperforms. Yeah, I guess I don't, I guess I don't really know exactly. I don't remember exactly where GK110 comes in. I know GK110 will be a much bigger chip because of its uh, uh, you know, inclusion of all the double precision stuff, in theory. Uh, whereas GK104 did not have a lot of that included and, and was able to... To run a little bit smaller on that. So, but yeah, like you're saying, these are all still rumors. 
but if you're interested, go go to PCPro.com. Uh, Tim has put up, made a little table of all of the current rumored specifications so you can see kind of where everything stands up, 7950 versus the 8950 versus the 8970, uh, and even where the 8870s come into, uh, come into the, the realm there as well. So interesting to see the Tenerife. I was there once. I hope they have their uh, reviewers event in Tenerife again. You my will. Wife, my wife would really be upset. <laughs> so speaking of things that That's are why you should send me, right? I need some sun. I have a feeling Kelly you is still upset. You do need some sun. I'm sun. not going to lie about that. I, I think it might be the coloration I've put in the LED lights, but even I look more tan than, than Josh does. Yeah, so, yeah so not hard that. to do. Yeah, we'll just we'll just put some we'll just put some post adjustment on your lighting. It won't happen. Put the lotion on my skin, or else I get the hose. So how about a, an all-in-one PC with a GTX 680 inside? It was a tight fit. Well, you just make the case bigger. Apparently, <laughs> Main Gear launched the new Alpha 24 Super stock all-in-one PC. So here, here it is, the Main Gear Alpha 24. Um, here's the trick, guys. Here's the trick. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. <laughs> Boom. So this is not your uh, ultra-thin 24-inch LED LCD TV type of thing. This is. Um, well, as you can see, it's got a dual-slot GTX 680 sitting here. I'm guessing it's a full-size retail card uh, in there. Any thoughts on this, anybody? Alan, are, are you still alive? Would you like to make a comment on this? Is this Would you like to re replace your system with an all-in-one touchscreen with a 680? Uh, I don't know about the touchscreen. You could play Battlefield 3 like this. <laughs> yeah, you could just be like... <laughs> What minority but report? Do you, do you have to have a pass-through cable to go from the back of that card to? Uh, you, you know what? If they use Lucid Virtue technology, oh, they don't have to. Do they that. don't have to. No. Eh, 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 I don't. Yeah. Know. Yeah, your your high-end gaming computer will be depending on it. But I mean, it's, so it's got HDMI output on the back, so it's obviously running. Uh, what are the specs on here? Is it? Where's Where's the full list? Um, oh god, it's awful! I, I it's like, got a thirty-seven seventy K in it. That's I like the idea of a six eighty and something that's small, but I don't know, the touch screen and everything else is kind of overdoing it. I don't even me. know if it has a touch screen. I know. assume it does, right? Surely it oh. does. Yeah. No, it's for yeah. Windows eight. So yeah, it's got a touch screen. Glossy touch screen. That's great for fingerprints. Um, uh, there is a cable card tuner option. I don't know. I mean, this you can get a killer nick on it. Uh, yeah, really? Yeah. Um, so it starts at thirteen forty nine. Obviously, that's probably not the one that comes with the six eighty. But you know, it's it's an interesting idea, right? You have a small space. The only the only problem I have with this, I have no problem with a super high powered PC, is you re like we talk about long upgrade cycles for monitors. This kind of forces you into a long upgrade cycle for monitors, right? You could. You could hook up a second display to it, and then, you know... You I bet could, you it couldn't be touchscreen, though. Uh, probably, well, I don't know. If it has a USB that. interface da, for the da, touch da, da, or da. something like that. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but, you know, I'm thinking, like, maybe you upgrade it to a 780 later or a 790. I assume you could upgrade it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the power supply in there is like. But you could hook a 30-inch 30 30 monitor up to it and then put this... Like on the floor, out of the way, or something like that, right? So now it just becomes a case, purpose, doesn't it? Becomes a case with a 24-inch display on it. Well, you know, you could you could be into flight sims and program yeah. that touchscreen yeah. to to be like, you oh, know, okay, uh, okay, a I'll panel. I could buy that. Yeah, it's just really expensive input device. It is. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's really cool. It, I don't know. It's. I don't think I would buy one of these, but I could see somebody going, you know what, I want a PC. It, it looks like it's fairly kind of moddable and upgradable. Um, so you have that option if you're comfortable with the 19 by 10, 24-inch screen lasting you into infinitum. Oh, wait, I'm scrolling down here for a little bit. What's for? What am I looking for? It's got two power connectors. That is one. Two thick. power connectors, yeah. Ken points out next to the GPU there are two. Let's see if I can zoom in some. I, I think Knight Rider says that two, it is three bricks. 
oh. that power it. Oh, okay. So there's one output right here. Now that could be one for the One for the Wi-Fi. computer and two for the graphics card. Yeah. Does it? Okay. So one to power the system, two to power the GPU. That makes sense. That's, that's what in the Navy we refer to as a kluge. Mm. Yeah. So you got three power bricks coming out the back of it. Um, all, all of them have different connectors, of course. Well, it looks like the two for the GPU are the same. <laughs> Swap those back and forth. It's not ideal for a lot of things, but it can be pretty cool for some things, I guess. If you want a kitchen top gaming computer because you only have a kitchen. And you have three outlets close to it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you need, maybe you need to put this in the laundry room with the, with the 230 spot. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's all that bad. Uh, Jeremy, quickly tell us about Catalyst 12.9. Well, we just, uh, in time for tonight, got the 12.9 beta being released by uh, AMD. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge difference uh, in the way of games compatibility, fixing old things that you know, I've been bugging people for a long time, like, say, stability and desktops and sleep mode. If you are into playing a panda online, apparently mm. it's good. What it did do is introduce something brand new, which they're calling Enduro technology. Right. And in this case, they have completely redesigned uh, the Catalyst Control Center user interface. So you can now see every single application you have. Not just games. There's a lot of GPU-enabled applications oh, sure. out there now. And so you can now base profiles of each and every one of these applications based on whether you're plugged into AC or if you're running on battery. And so you can bounce back and forth between just using uh, your Trinity APU or using a discrete uh, GPU in hybrid crossfire. So for mobile users, this is actually you know a really nice step up. All of a sudden, they've got the ability on a per application basis to yep. say, if... I'm running on battery power. None of this is allowed to touch my discrete GPU. Everything has to come off of the CPU. Battery life is going to soar. Should. For this desktop users, go ahead. it's not going to mean so much, but uh, considering that you know most AMD systems that are recommended to people now are laptops because just plug it in. It's like a computer. You get a monitor for it, a keyboard, everything else. Just Spend a little bit extra, and for AMD, it's usually just that little bit extra if you keep an eye out uh, for sales. I like this. And boom. I like this a- uh, resolved issue they listed. Try and quad crossfire plus Ifinity configurations. Users will no longer see lower than expected performance in certain DX10 and DX11 applications. Certain unspecified <laughs> applications. Yeah, just tell me. Yeah. Um, so you know what, what's interesting? Firefox and Crossfire too. Ah. So the Enduro technology is AMD's attempt to kind of catch up to NVIDIA's Optimus on the mobile side, right? And uh, AMD had fallen way behind. Um, Their their switchable graphics technology was pretty bad for a long time. Uh, Hardware switches initially, uh, and then, you know, things where what it would actually have to do is it would... they They used to have to package their their graphics card driver with an Intel driver. And that's what held up a lot of their mobile drivers. They had to wait for Intel to approve of of these things because the driver had to, um, if you're running something on the integrated graphics and you wanted to switch to discrete or vice versa, you had to basically put all of the applications into like a paused state, copy the data from the frame buffer from one GPU to the other, and then restart those 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 processes and uh, it was a pain in the butt to do reliably and accurately so now they have a system that allows them to change seamlessly um, what they can even do that I think is cool is you know you if you have a game open in a window that that game is being powered by the GPU but the rest of it is not like the rest of the screen is still being mm-hmm. you know being based on the integrated graphics or uh, you know from Ivy Bridge sure. or Sandy Bridge so they've they've done they've done some cool stuff there uh, and I'm, I'm hoping I don't we do have uh, we have one laptop here with a 6990 in it, and maybe we'll be able to get this software in there and kind of play around with it and see what it does. Well, it would be nice to see because the one key phrase that they do not use in any of the PR that I saw was on the fly. So I'm not it sure if you can work actually on switch back and forth your settings without a reboot. But as you're saying, once the applications are set, yeah, you're running a game in a windowed mode. That is using the GPU. Yep. Everything else, not touching it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so there, it's 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 much improved software from what I have seen uh, when I was out at IDF and we went to the when I when I go to the Intel Developer Forum and have my AMD meeting, <laughs> they showed off Enduro uh, and it seemed to work seemed to work pretty well, but obviously it was a little customized setup there. Um, what else? Uh, see, somebody put in here the long term storage. I don't know if this was Jeremy or, or Alan spoke about this the media that might last a million years what about the reader what do we what what is this story about hitachi's created a sliver of quartz glass two centimeters by two centimeters two, two millimeters. millimeters thick and the storage density of a cd yeah they're basically writing i think they're just laser etching yep the quartz so the idea is that it's quartz so, so you, you can store huh you, i mean Fingerprints no, like a CD, it, Ryan. No, no, no. I mean, you can store whatever you store in there. It's staying okay. for a long, long time. Right? It's quartz. Stuff's very durable. Nothing really affects it. You can heat it up, cool it down. Whatever's etched in there is pretty much going to stay. So I think the idea is that to just have a really high resolution ability to etch. Hmm. You know, really think of a think of it as like a laser printer with a like. Is this a like next DPI. generation microfiche? Like you take it out of a little cardboard sort box of. and you put it on a reader and you kind of slide it around to see all the bits. Yeah, you know, think Stargate, <laughs> right? It's those freaking whatever. Do, I don't know, do we awesome have to think, think Stargate? Stargate? Can we talk about Stargate for hours on end in the back of a limo? Um, um, yeah, only if we get our awesome. buddy back on the podcast again. Yep. I don't know what that reference is, but it kind of scares me, Josh. It's, yeah. it's come on. You do not remember that. He, no, he's probably blocked Is this from it. Tahoe? Yes. Oh, Lake Tahoe. Something we have pushed from our memories, but I've brought it to the fore again. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is when Josh and I spent our romantic weekend together at Lake Tahoe in a cabin. He uh, proposed to me. And he said, said, would you write to and me? And he said no. Oh, yeah. And yeah, would you happened. Would you write to me? <laughs> and he sent me a box of chocolates, and I said yes. That's, that's still kind of weird. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, it's time for the hardware software picks of the week, and I didn't come up with anything. Uh, and you can't pick your T-shirt. No, I'm not going to pick the iPhone 5, Ken. Sorry. Uh, mm-hmm. How about we just go ahead and start with Jeremy, and then we'll move on to maybe I will have made something up by then. Uh, I see here. Mm-hmm. Well, <coughs> fallbacks. Excuse me. Took me by surprise. I guess I'm on a little bit of a classic kick uh, or classic game kick lately, uh, having brought up Black Mesa not too long ago. But uh, not too long ago, uh, we had a little article put up by Scott, uh, who sort of said, you know, why can't video game be art? Well, here are two perfect examples of video game being art. One of uh, Josh's favorite, Thief 2, and one of my favorite, System Shock 2. Just got a brand new community update they're totally stable, well, maybe not totally stable, I'm sure you can find a way to break it, but significantly more stable in modern operating systems, and they've been brought up to modern resolutions and for a little bit fiddled around for textures and such. So if you've got no idea what I'm talking about with these games, you deserve it to yourself to go find out. Thief 2 you can grab uh, from good old games, it's about $10 to get the Metal Age or so. Uh, System Shock 2... Look for a used one. Uh, if you follow one of the links in my article, you'll know why you're not allowed to buy System Shock 2 on bloody well anything, up to and including Origin, which could actually work because it's one of the companies that owns the trademark. Not the other one, but nice. at least one of them. So there, it's System possibly Shock fine. 2 is still one of my favorite games of oh. all time. And so you can replay it. I cannot find my discs anywhere. I know that they're somewhere in here. But... Uh, now you can do it, because if anyone's played with good old games, you know that, hey, it's brilliant. Oh, this is a whole classic game. I want to play it. And you end up playing it in Windows 640 by 480 and kind of just not really enjoying it as much as you could have. You mean in this case... Sorry? This game? System Shock Oh, you... Two. Can you burn me oh. a cop? Oh. <laughs> I've paid for it at least twice. Oh, oh. System Shock so, Yes, you, Josh... You can open that up. There is a community patch. It will now run on Windows 7. It will now support the high resolutions that the monitors of today support and that we could only dream of back in the day. In the day. In the day. So, hey, 
you owe it to yourself if you don't know what I'm talking about. And if you do know what I'm talking about, you're probably already digging out for the CDs. You know, I'll tell you what. Whenever I hear wind chimes, I always think of the Looking Glass Studio, you know, thing pop up whenever you load up one of their games. Yeah. It just sticks with you. And Anytime the entire glass, ship inverts and I'm staring at an upside down cross, I think of that lovely AI in that game. You guys are weirding me she out. Just wanted to help. You guys are you guys are weirding me out. Uh Josh, your turn. Me. You know, for work I I, I bought a bare bones and I like it. It was a uh, Foxconn little A three fifty base system. You got to really think about how you're putting it together because it comes with like no instructions whatsoever. So I, I took about ten minutes to figure out how to Ooh, mount the tiny. actual damn hard drive, if not a little longer. But once you do such a thing, it all fits together nice. You know the build quality is actually surprisingly good. The buttons hmm. feel nice. It's all a metal case except for you know the plastic front. And, uh, you know, it's got an integrated power supply and, and it, you know, runs dual core A350 or E350, rather. So what all did you add? Hard drive and memory? Hard drive, memory, and a uh, DVD drive. And that's Optical what? all you need. Yeah, DVD drive. DVD Optical. burner for like 19 bucks. They memory for my hard burner. $21, if even that. Hard drive for fifty bucks, and you know, for that's good under three hundred dollars. That's it's a nice little system to have if you want something like that. Add a little bit more money, put a Blu-ray player in there, and you got a nice HD PC. All right, Alan, do you have anything specific for us? Yeah, I'm gonna say uh, get all the 830s you can while they're on. Well, that's an 840. Get all the 830s you can while they're on. Uh, Show off. Show off times oh, those two. Are different capacities. Oh my bad. That's the newer one. Yeah, no. Yeah. So, uh, only got four of these. While, while the stores are clearing out their dude. shelves for the newer ones, um, get the old ones on sales. There's probably going to be more sales than just what was that Tiger Direct and Newegg. Um, yeah. Because there's other suppliers that have these things that are expecting 840s to come in, so they're all going to be blowing them out. That's what I would imagine. They're yeah. going to be take advantage. This Korea. is the week to do it. Huh? All right, is it my turn now? Or are you guys done? I keep trying. I don't to find know. Have we delayed enough? I can't. You got something? Yeah. So here it is. <laughs> what is what is it? It's um, a lunchbox. Okay. Well, it, oh, it's probably that PSU we were talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is about the size of the fifteen hundred watt power supply. So this is what it is. It is an AVA Direct Mini ITX gaming system, and uh, it uses it's one of these, bigger than this, a bread box. Toaster. One of these Bit Phoenix cases. That's actually pretty it's nice. A toaster. So here. It's kind of heavy, too. Um, let me show you the, the inside real quick. We're, we're obviously going to do a video and a review of this very soon. So you can see it's got a 850-watt power supply and EVGA GTX 680. Um, on the back, you'll see it has a mini ITX Z77 motherboard uh, from Asus, it looks like. And it has a Core i7-3770K overclocked. And uh, it's hard to see back there. The cool, the CPU cooler is freaking enormous too. It's um, like a tunic tower or something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't. Really, what are they? I try to remember the model number, and I can't find the model number anywhere. They don't list it on their site yet because it's not. Um, it's, and you can use really it as a idea. hammer throw as well. Yes, <laughs> it's it's uh, actually eighty five percent of the weight of that system. I mean, it's the thing is, it just you know, it's it's not enormous. It's incredibly heavy for it's it's a dense. Let's put it that way. It's dense. Does it have a fan? Like uh, does it have a fan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a fan on the back okay. here. There's a fan no, on the heat sink. Is the heat sink passive or does it have a fan on it? It has a fan, Ken says. I can't see in here yet. Yeah, there's a fan. Okay. Um, and then there's a then there's a larger fan on the back above the motherboard. Um, I'm trying to take this the top of this thing off. Josh gets that a lot. Mm, no, I don't. Yeah, here I'll show you the top without the uh, the filter on. So you can see the optical, you see the optical drive and the heatsink with the fan on it in there. So this is, I don't know exactly what it's going to cost. I, the case is actually pretty interesting. I haven't used any of the BitPhoenix stuff personally. I like the look of it uh, with these kind of things. But to see, see how this flexes a lot. Wait, right what? Here? See this? How it flexes? That's the handle. 
It's well, like really stiff needle. I'm not sure it's supposed to be a handle. I'm not 100% sure. And also, if you notice, my hands are, are off the table now. And if I wiggle it, it kind of... Like, the bottom is just like this as well. So I imagine it's, it's fairly strong. And maybe it's meant to keep vibrations from the system from reaching the floor or vice versa or something. Uh, yeah. Plus, it's, 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 it's like earthquake safe. See? Yeah. We'll go with that. When your hard drives are spinning uncontrollably. Oh, uh, there's an SSD in here and a, and a traditional hard drive too. So <sighs> that's going to be it. So that that's my pick. Uh, the unnamed AVA Direct <laughs> system that we will have a review up very soon. So just keep checking back for that. We're going to do a cool video. I think I might try to, after we've tested it all, uh, take it all apart and see if I can put it back together correctly. Yeah, and, and, and then if I can't send up? them back so, a box so, of the parts, so Ken can finish up uh, burning up a CD uh, mm. D, uh, CPU, so I can. Oh yeah, get gotcha. In Forty minutes. Let's do that. Uh, we are going to wrap up the show for now. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, PCPro.com slash podcast is the URL to share with your friends, post it on forums, um, spray paint it on your neighbor's house. I don't really care how you spread the word about the show, but I would prefer that you did. And uh, if, you wanna, if, you, if you're listening to this recorded and you want to be part of the fun and excitement that is pre-show and post-show and maybe the post-show gaming part of stuff, um, PCPro.com slash live is the place to be. You uh, can go there and join into the chat rooms and hang out with us while we do not really much of incredible interest. But uh, it's fun. It's fun. We like having we like having the live audience. So we will be back next week with another episode. And I promise I'll well, I'll put it this way. I promise I will try to remember to pick a piece of hardware or software before the show begins. I'm Ryan Schrapp. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malventano. Thanks, guys.